over the quizzes myself, and Randy did, And but if you still have questions, uh, he's written a lot of things on them for you, uh, so they should be fairly clear. Um, one of the things that um, advice I would give you would be to read the uh, lecture outlines. Uh, <laughs> Lecture outline number three was on the Davis scorecard, and it was detailed enough. But I went back, and I just got my lecture notes transcribed from Donna Modesto, and I went back and was reading them the weekend. And the very first lecture, the second paragraph, says, um, read um, Hilgardia about uh, off odors, uh, the 17 off odors. And uh, some people apparently didn't do that because we got some really uh, weird answers for uh, some of the um, off odors. Um, and this Davis scorecard uh, was apparently too difficult. I uh, couldn't quite figure that out since uh, we gave it in detail and even suggested part scores and half scores and so forth. That um, question having to do with the tannin and, and so forth was uh, really out of that lecture outline. Uh, also, the outline on sources of information um, <laughs> was pretty specific. Uh, he even said that Index Medicus did not have abstracts, so all you had to do was read the outline and never put down Index Medicus as a source of abstracts. It lists references, but doesn't give any abstract. The problem was to where would you get the abstract because you can't read the original language quickest. And that wasn't very difficult if you read those outlines. Well, anyway, that's what the scores were, 42 to 94 and a half. There were seven above 90. There were 16, 80 to 90, and the rest of them were down. I don't have any quizzes for Mr. Rasti, Mr. Walker, and Mr. Musto. I don't have any reports from Mr. Whitmer and Bishop, although I find they're in the laboratory, so maybe they ought to see me and explain which part of the course they're taking. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the lecture today is not a terribly long one, and I thought I would go back for just a moment and talk about one other uh, French district, because the um, uh, district has some lessons for California, and it's the district of Alsace. Uh, it's way up in the upper corner of the um, so, uh, northeast uh, corner of France. If, um, if this was the Burgundy district here, Alsace is there, and the Rhine River, is, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, is going up that direction. So here is Alsace. Between 1870 and 1918, the Germans used it for blending wines, to blend with East German wines. And so a lot of Chasselas Doré was planted. They used them for table grapes, and they used them for uh, wine grapes. Uh, they used the, the simple, uh, non- uh, not very strong flavored wine uh, to blend with uh, East German wines, or what was then East German wines, uh, Prussia, uh, which were very high in acid and low in alcohol. And so Alsace uh, lost whatever reputation it had before 1870. And in 1920, the French government had to decide what to do with Alsace, uh, something like we had to decide what to do in California after 1933. Uh, they already had a source of blending wine for France. Uh, during and after Phylloxera, they had developed Algeria as a source of blending wine for the mainland, for France. So there was no point in, develop in taking those wines to France because they had more wine than they could take care of from Algeria, and it was cheaper from Algeria. So here was a district, um, several thousand acres of grapes, uh, the chief source of livelihood for a large number of the people, which really didn't have any uh, market for its wines anymore. None of the French people knew them, and the Germans couldn't afford it and didn't want them anyway. They uh, decided that the way to, to take care of Alsace would be to build up the, the varietal plantings, to get rid of the chasselas, get rid of the table grapes, get rid of the blending grapes, and plant uh, better varieties. And that's been going on from that day to this, and has gradually uh, resulted in the development of an industry that's based upon four varieties. Uh, the one that they now like the best, and which seems to be the one that will eventually predominate, is Gewürztraminer. 
And one of the reasons why this variety has worked is that they've been able by clonal selection to pick out producers of the Bergstraminer that have much better production than the old varieties of their old clones they were using before. So the Bergstraminer is a pretty good producing variety for, um, for Alsace, and it makes a very distinctive wine, very uh, aromatic wine, almost muscat-like wine. And so this has become sort of the standard type uh, of Alsace wine. The biggest producer per acre, however, is Sylvan. And it's the largest planted variety at the present time of the new varieties they put in. Produces a fair standard quality wine uh, almost every year. In northern Alsace, in the upper part, up near Strasbourg, the Sylvaner is particularly favored. The Gewürztraminer and the White Riesling are more favored in the southern part of Alsace. And I must say there is a difference from one part to the other. Then there's also some Pinot Gris, which they sometimes call Toque Alsace. You can tell these varieties apart very easy. The Gewürztraminer has a russet color, a little tight cluster, very similar to a Chardonnay cluster, only tighter than a Chardonnay cluster, and russet color. The Pinot Gris also has a small cluster, and it's russet colored also. So there's two of these varieties that have a russet color to make white wines from, and two of them that have uh, more or less greenish yellow co color, the Silvana being more yellow and the Riesling being more green. So they're not very difficult to tell these four varieties apart. The old varieties are gradually being removed. And uh, Alsace only has one appellation of origin at the present time, and that is the appellation of origin of Alsace. The variety is supposed to be 100% for the variety, but as I said in one of the sections the other day, the French law on varieties is very much left to the imagination. It simply says that the label will have no untrue information. Well, I can't believe everything you read in the paper. The other thing that about France that I would like to say about is the region just on the other side of Chablis. This is on one side of Chablis. On the other side of Chablis is the Champagne district. It used to have several varieties, but now it's down to just about two, maybe with a few Pinot Noir and its clone, Meunier. Um, clone is looks like Pinot Noir, but it has a lot of russet color on the other underside of the cluster, so you can very easily pick it out. Two thirds of the grapes in Champagne are Pinot Noir, and one third is Chardonnay. And they're very low in alcohol. The reason for planting the Pinot Noir is to get sugar. If they had only Chardonnay. Uh, most of the years it would have less than 9% alcohol. And so they can't make 100% of the wine from Chardonnay, it just doesn't have enough alcohol. There's too much acid and too low in alcohol in Chardonnay to make a good balanced wine. Now in recent years, however, uh, there's been a fad developing for a wine called Blanc the Blancs, a white wine made from white grapes, Blanc de Blancs, and it's possible to do this in, a, in Champagne, but only in the very warm years. So these wines that are called Blanc de Blancs are only going to be made in years like 1959, 1961, 1964, 1969, 1970. Those are the years when they can make a Blanc de Blanc. The rest of the time they're blending the higher alcohol white wine from Pinot Noir with the higher alcohol, with the low alcohol white wine from Chardonnay to make their blends for making Champagne. They'd like to get rid of the Pinot Noir. It's a very expensive grape there. It has to be hand sorted before it can be crushed. If you have a cluster of Pinot Noir and one berry has been injured by bees or by mold or something and it's started to ferment, somebody has to pull that berry out by hand before it's crushed. Otherwise, you'll get a pink colored juice and then you can't make white wines from it anymore. So they don't want the Pinot Noir. They would much prefer to do without it and just depend on Chardonnay. But what are they going to do with all the wine from the years that don't make enough sugar from Chardonnay? Then they wouldn't be able to have wine every year. So this is a this blend is a is a compromise in order to produce 
some sort of champagne every year in the Champagne District. Okay, now we'll go now to the new outline for today and talk a little bit about the, the German problem. Um, so the reason I told you the Alsace story is that uh, is because it's something like the problem in California. Only we didn't go about it as fast. Well, maybe we did. After all, 1920 to 1970 is 50 years, and 1930 to 1970 is only uh, 40 years. So it isn't, they've only had 10 more years, really. They really didn't get started until 1922 on that project. And we didn't really get started on planting varieties of grapes until about 1967. So uh, there is isn't not too much difference between the two regions. Um, we would have thought that, you know, with, a, with less prejudice for the past sort of thing, that we might have changed faster than Alsace. But I suppose the government had some sort of leverage. I think they gave them some subsidies to plant the new varieties. So maybe that um, it's just hard to get a farmer to change varieties. Once he's got in Alicante Boucher, he doesn't want to take it out. And, uh, or Thompson Seedless, as the case might be. Well, that doesn't apply to Germany. Germany is, is undergoing some uh, revolution, but uh, it's for other reasons. Let's talk about the geographical and climatic factors to start with. It's cool in Germany, every place. In many places, it's not cool in Germany. And so every year, some wines have to be sugared. In some years, all the wines have to be sugared. If this is the Rhine as it runs along the northern border of Switzerland, and Alsace here, down here, the first district we come to is a small district, very much like, very much like Alsace, called Baden, with some of the same problems as Alsace. Namely, how do you get rid of the Chasseless Doré? And how do you get them to plant good varieties of grapes? Uh, they've taken uh, this district and practically revamped it in the last 50 years by pulling out the Schatz list. Uh, if you visit one district in Germany, Alsa, uh, uh, Baden is one place to go because they have a very modern uh, cooperative there, which has practically been at the forefront of this development that you can make good wines in Baden if you have good grapes. The next little district is right up here. It's called the Rhine Falls. And this is the Sylvaner district. This is still mixed Sylvaner plus other varieties. And this does have other varieties too. And this great big area right along here is the Rhine Hessen. And the district right opposite it. The most favored district, as far as exposure is concerned, is the Rhine Gal. And then running over here is the Moselle. And the way out here in right field is Franconia. Only it's about down here is where it actually is. Well, they're cold, and the first thing that you have to think about in terms of uh, Germany is exposure. They need exposure to the east, which they get along here, sun coming up and hitting it here, or to the south. And the place that you see this most dramatically is along the slopes of the Moselle. The Moselle runs in a sort of southwest to northeast direction, and all the good locations are located on the side of the hill where the sun hits it in the morning. Right opposite, where the sun doesn't hit it until the afternoon, there won't be any grapes planted, or there will just be a few vineyards planted. So that this is a very dramatic illustration. Here along the Rhine, you'll see some vines on both sides, but the big high quality vineyards are facing south, you know, on the north side of the river facing south. So they get the morning sun, the noon sun, and the afternoon sun. Also, there, the drainage is very important. There's practically no vines 
that are not on well-drained soil. All of this soil is sloping down to the river here. In the same way over here. So that, and, and even in Alsace, in uh, Franconia, the, uh, all those, the vineyards are slow. So that temperature of the soil is important. The exposure to the sun is very important. And even the, the drainage in various areas. There's been a very thorough study made uh, along a little river that runs off here called the Ruvere River. The meteorologists in Germany have shown that you can't plant grapes in certain parts of that river because the drainage of the air, of the cold air, down is such that the vines will be too cold and they will not ripen. And so they have, the meteorologists have shown them just exactly where to plant and where not to plant on that little river. There's another little river that runs right along here called the Naha River. The same thing is true there. The, the wind direction and the drainage of the air are so important that it makes the difference between whether you can grow grapes or you can't grow grapes. If it weren't for this very nice selection of locations, they couldn't have a grape industry in, in uh, Germany. Uh, the new German law reduces the number of named vineyards. I was just reading to somebody today in the library uh, of some magazine uh, that the plans are now to reduce from 12,000 named vineyards down to 2,000 named vineyards. So this is a major change, and there's a special office that's been set up in, in Mainz for just this reduction in the number of named vineyards. Then they're going to classify all of the uh, wines into one of, uh, I guess I've only given you three categories here, the other one isn't important. The Deutscher Tafel wine, or German table wine, will just be wines that will say Moselle, or Rhine, or Franconia, or something like that. They will all be sugared wines, that is, they will have sugar added to them to make them. They will not have any vineyard or village names, they will be district wines. And uh, they, will n they will have a number on them, but there will apparently be no tasting of these wines. The new German law provides that every wine that's entitled to the upper two categories now, which I'll come to in a second, will have a number on it and will have been tasted by a tasting commission. So um, the, the region is, uh, is, um, is specified and uh, the, the first category they can add sugar but within limits. In the second category they can add sugar but within more restricted limits. And this is what's called German Qualitates Wine from a determined vineyard, Bestimpter Anbaugebiete means from a determined, Bestimpter means a specified or determined, Anbaugebiete means vineyard area or, or area. And so uh, villages can be used on in this category like Oppenheimer or like Rouvert, this one I just gave you, the little river that runs down here or Naha, or Bob Kreutznach, one of the villages down that river, and so forth. But they can add sugar. There will be qualitates wine, but they can add sugar. If they have enough natural sugar, they have put a minimum limit on the amount of natural sugar, and above that they can add some sugar. And then finally there is the best one, the Deutscher qualitates wine, mit predicate, that means that it specifies everything, uh, the village and the vineyard, and these could not have any sugar to add it. This is the old, uh, these labels will now all go out of existence, but this is the old Natur wine label. Natur wine meaning a wine that had had no sugar added to it. They will also um, be able to use in this category that Spate Lazy, Aus Lazy, Beeren Aus Lazy, and Prokinerian Aus Lazy series. Uh, the one Spate meaning late picked, and Auslazy, Beeren Auslazy, and Trocken Beeren Auslazy, meaning uh, grapes that have been attacked by Botrytis, and they've been picked out uh, from the uh, Botrytis grapes. Uh, the other kinds of labels that we had before are being downgraded. There were a large number of these kind of wines uh, uh, that had fancy German designations on them. The attempt has been make to make German labels easier to read so that you didn't have to be an expert. Uh, why they couldn't have picked out some better words than Deutscher Qualitätswein, 
Bistimter Anbhagavita. I don't know how many of you can pronounce Bistimter Anbhagavita without stumbling. Uh, and it's not Baita, it's Bita. Uh, the word cabinet will continue to be used, sometimes spelled K A B I N E T P, or cabinet. This comes from an old practice that the owner, the non resident owner of the winery, had 10% of the best wine set aside for him. The rest of it was sold and went into the profits of the corporation, but about 10% was kept for the owner of the place for his own use and for his sale to his friends or to the Kaiser or the bishop or whoever it might be. Uh, that will continue to be possible to use that, but it doesn't have very much meaning. The attempt of the new German law is to spell out all the things that the Germans can put on the labels and make them have some meaning. I think they've over-exaggerated the amount of imagination that the German winemakers have, however, they'll get another new set of terms to use on the labels very quickly. Now, making wine in Germany is much more difficult than it is in France or Italy or perhaps any place else in the world. First of all, they have lots of botrytis every year. And the botrytis goes from gray mold to green mold and rots of various kinds come in so that they almost always have cloudy must. Uh, and the old method of settling uh, and then taking off the clear liquid is still used. But you will see almost every place uh, centrifuges now in Germany. A large amount of the must, not all of them, but a large amount of them are, are centrifuged, particularly in wet years when there's lots of botrytis. This gets around the problem of browning of the new wines because most of the polyphenol oxidase is uh, taken away by the centrifuge and you have a clear liquid with not very much enzyme in it and uh, you are able to get wines that will stay um, clear. The low sugar, of course, is a problem and the amount that's added is limited by law in all cases and you have to have a certain amount of natural um, sugar in the case of the middle category. The high acid, now they've, they've developed a new method of doing the high acid. Uh, they used to just add calcium carbonate. And then when I was there in 54, they were beginning to use ion exchange to get rid of the high acid. And um, just recently they've begun to use a new method which they call the double neutralization procedure. One half the must is half neutralized with calcium carbonate. And then after that has been mixed, within a day or two, they uh, add uh, some more of the original must, the other half of the original must. And this leads to a double salt formation of calcium tartrate and potassium tartrate. And you get a great deal better reduction in acidity from the double salt formation than you would just from the calcium carbonate. The problem with calcium carbonate is that you don't want to add too much calcium carbonate and reduce the acidity too much. So you get a better balanced or a better uh, uh, pH by using the double neutralization than you do using a single neutralization uh, and makes the wines better tasting. Because the wines are high in acid, most German wines are sweet. Uh, this is, I'm sorry to say, a fact of life. It's becoming more true with time and uh, it has been brought about by their great technical skill. Uh, the um, they understand the use of SO2 very thoroughly. They're still able to use DEPC. And they, of course, have had germ-proof filtration with the Sykes EK filter being the most important sterilizing filter that the world has had about 40 years now since the Sykes EK came. The Sykes people give schools for training people how to use the Sykes EK filter and special rooms are set up for bottling with the Zeit CK filter. And the result is that it's very rare that you find a gassy or cloudy German wine on the market, in spite of the fact that it's unstable. In spite of the fact that it's unstable. It's usually around 10.5 alcohol and 2 to 4% of sugar. This is among the most unstable kinds of wines to keep. And yet, by the use, even with cold bottling and so forth, they are able to germ-proof filter and keep the yeast out and the bacteria out, adding just the right amount of SO2, 
sometimes too much, but trying to add just amount of the right amount. In order to get this residual sugar, in the upper two, in all three of these categories, they cannot add the sugar after the fermentation. So it's necessary to stop the fermentation with the sugar still in it, because thereafter uh, you can't add sugar. You can add grape juice, and that's the, really the newest trick in Germany right now. Every winery in Germany, just within the last three years, every winery in Germany now puts up a few thousand liters of grape juice every year, which they store in uh, pressure tanks, uh, germ-proof filtered as best they can, and then keep that to sweeten up the, the new wines as they're bottled six months or a year later. Uh, before that, uh, they, they had to stop the fermentations without any, um, with some sugar left. And uh, that was done uh, for the last 30 or 40 years by pressure fermentations. By pressure fermentations, the wine and the musk is fermented in a pressure tank capable of withstanding about 150, 200 pounds per square inch of pressure. And when the pressure got up to about eight atmospheres, that would be eight times um, 16, 120 pounds, 130 pounds per square inch, the fermentation would almost cease. It will not be complete, it will not stop completely, but it would slow down. And then they would release the pressure down to atmospheric pressure. The fermentation would start again, and then they would allow the pressure to build up uh, again. And by this method, they slowed the rate of fermentation down so that it, instead of going down in the familiar, this kind of thing, the sugar content went down like this. And at least three or four of these periods of fermentation with pressure went on. Uh, and eventually, when you got uh, over here, the, uh, the wine would tend to clear, the fermenting wine would tend to clarify itself and would stick in many cases at one or two percent sugar. It would then be filtered out. They'd have a large amount of time to do this. They would filter it out of the tanks and then hold it with SO2 or DEPC or hold it in an, another pressure tank. So the pressure fermentations were a method of slowing down the fermentation and two, of uh, uh, retaining residual sugar. The third advantage of the pressure fermentation was that you got a tiny bit more alcohol per gram of sugar fermented. Uh, that's because there's not so much multiplication of the yeast. One of the ways to lose alcohol, potential alcohol, is to produce more yeast. That's why you try and keep the wine away from the air. Uh, if you, the more yeast you produce, the more yeast cells you have to produce, the more sugar is going into making cellular material. So in the pressure fermentations, you do not get as much multiplication of the yeast. Therefore, there is less of the sugar going into the cell uh, material, and therefore you get more alcohol per gram of sugar per minute. It doesn't amount to very much, maximum of one or two tenths percent of alcohol. But if you've only got nine and ten percent alcohol, one or two tenths percent makes some difference. Well, they get by with this uh, without much trouble. Uh, this big, very prestigious uh, German Staatsdomain, that's the government winery, which is the largest owner of vineyards in the Rheingau here. Vineyards all along the Rheingau, very prominent vineyards. Uh, they have all pressure tanks, the whole vineyard. Uh, uh, Schloss Johannesburg, uh, which is just opposite here, uh, which is certainly a very prestigious name, they have a lot of um, pressure tanks. On the other hand, uh, uh, there are other vineyards in, the, in the, this district and most of the vineyards over here that don't like the pressure tank wines. We think they all have a sauerkraut smell. Uh, and uh, they certainly do when we make, when we use the pressure tanks here. And Professor Webb's evidence from Australia is that they do there also. And so in areas where the pH is not very low, in other words, where it's like California or like Australia, in those areas where the pH is 3, 5, 3, 6, and lactobacillus spoilage is a problem, then pressure fermentations are not for you because these almost always get cloudy from the lactic acid bacteria in those conditions. 
They're very hard to keep from getting a sauerkraut smell. Uh, Mr. O and I must have done a hundred of these fermentations all together, and maybe we got a dozen of the hundred to have some sort of decent result. The rest um, weren't very good. Besides, we have plenty of sugar in California. If we want to have a sweet wine, we can have it. And besides, we don't have it too much acid. So we don't really need to make or don't have to make sweet wines in California to cover up the acid taste. So this is not really a problem for California. And we've strongly recommended against the pressure tank system for California. The, I might just point out in passing the, the value of research. Um, that project cost Mr. Owen, I suppose, a, a month or two of our time. The equipment was worth, uh, well, we used equipment for many things, but taking just that one and say a tenth of the equipment cost would be about $3,000, $4,000. Uh, our salaries for a couple of months, well, are low enough, but let's say that, uh, let's say that all together with student health and everything that we put maybe $15,000 in that project. The initial projects that we saw for the Napa Valley called for a half a million dollars per winery in pressure fermentations. And after they saw the results, they all gave it up. And there isn't, still isn't a single pressure fermentation tank in California. So maybe quite a number of million dollars came out of just a tiny bit of research that was done largely just to satisfy ourselves that it did have some possibilities or didn't have some possibilities. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you can't sell that over in Sacramento right now. The important thing is to uh, lecture out of the textbook over in Sacramento, devil with research. That's my sermon for the day. <laughs> Couldn't resist it. <laughs> well, I've already spoken about great production. The production in Germany per acre is more than two times what it was 60 years ago. And that's all been done by clonal selection. In some areas, it's as much as three and four times as much as it was then. In recent years, they, of course, have had the problem of virus selection. So between clonal selection and virus-free grapes, the average of Germany as a whole is up three times from 1910, uh, showing that there is a great importance for viticulturalists. There's been a big to-do in recent years about ice wine. Uh, ice wine is where the grapes are allowed to stay on the vines until the, they freeze solid. Then you get up at um, 4 o'clock in the morning and you pick the frozen grapes and you bring them in and press them immediately. The ice has frozen out and what is not frozen is the sugar solution. So by this method you're able to produce a wine that would be entitled to the uh, third category, that is, you could call it a qualitates wine mit predicate, that had no sugar in it, and it would be sweet. It tastes like the very devil, however, that's the trouble. <laughs> it tastes like frosted wines always taste, and they usually are rather dark in color, and they have a high degree of sherry quality, they're, they're high in acetaldehyde. And yet they, the demand for sweet German wines is so great that they've been selling these at 10 and $12 a bottle. Now, I don't mind somebody paying 10 12 or $20 a bottle for a Trockenbeeren Auslese, where they've gone into the vineyard and picked out dried, buried selections, as I explained in bit three. There, there is a cost factor. One person all day long picks enough grapes to make one bottle of wine. So I can see why it's going to cost money to, for a Trockenbeeren Auslese. But in this case, they're picking whole grapes and pressing them off and making what I consider to be a secondary quality wine. Don't tell my friends in San Francisco that because a lot of them have invested in ice wine as a, as a poor man's Trockenbeeren Auslese. They're about one half to one third as expensive as Trockenbeeren Auslese. Incidentally, you never say Trockenbeeren Auslese anymore either. That's very poor taste. You say TBA. That's the, that's the N word in San Francisco. <laughs> Really, I'm not kidding you. That's exactly true. I had a TBA. You'd think it was something else. Okay, so much then for Germany. With, with less, uh, my conclusion in bit three is still good. With less chances of making good wine, uh, but they're high technological standards, they make a greater percentage of, of bottle quality wine than any other country in Europe. And they're able to sell it at reasonable prices. Uh, all over the world, and uh, in general, uh, from the 
from the upper two categories of wines, the one with village and vineyard names on them, uh, you get a good drinking wine. Sometimes a little too acid, quite often too sweet for me, but nevertheless, uh, pretty good wines. Switzerland is the perfect example where grapes ought never to have been planted, <laughs> but uh, they had to plant them there because they need some wine. About two-thirds of all the wine drunk in Switzerland is imported. It's the largest percentage importation of any country. Maybe Sweden and places like that, yes, because they don't grow grapes. But for a country that grows grapes, Switzerland still has to import two gallons for every gallon that it makes on its own. It's just too cold in Switzerland. Uh, in the West, that Chasselas Doré that I've already spoken about for Alsace and Baden is the primary grape, 90% of Neuchâtel and of Lausanne and Veve and those runs around the lake there are uh, Chasselas Doré. The other names for that variety you might be interested in, the German name is Gudedel, the Swiss name is Fondant, the French name is Chasselas Doré, and the Napa Valley name is Sweetwater, which probably describes it better than anything else. And that's why it shouldn't be made into wine. It just tastes essentially like sweet water as far as the grapes are concerned. There is in Valais, which is a little valley that runs up toward Mont Blanc, where you have beautiful views of Mont Blanc, there is an area of maybe a couple of thousand acres uh, where they grow some good red and white wines. Over on the Italian side, at Ticino and Lugano, you find some Merlots that are fairly good wines. And then uh, in the far eastern part of the country, around Zurich, you find Pinot Noir, which they call Kledner. So that variety, Pinot Noir, we now have three names for it. Pinot Noir in, in France, um, Kledner, or Kledner, which is the name you want, in eastern Switzerland. And about 10% uh, or less of German wines are red. And there's a very famous one right here that is made from Pinot Noir. And in Germany, it's always called Spät, meaning late, Burgunder. Now, it has other names in other parts of Europe, but those are the three names for Pinot Noir that are important. Well, we're getting a lot of Austrian wines on the American market right now, and I think I ought to say something about uh, Austria and the developing countries to the east of there. First of all, it's cool in Austria. Second, they inherited a terrible uh, technical problem. Uh, before World War I, most of the wines were made in little caves, dug into the sides of the hills along the Danube, uh, where it's, the soil is very clay and it was easy to dig them. Uh, I've been in some of these since World War I, since World War II, uh, and they're pretty primitive. You also can see where they were uh, before World War I in Hungary, and even occasionally in Romania. It was a family industry without the technical know-how of the Germans, and it didn't make very good wine. There was no export before World War II. And uh, the, one of the, the important things about the industry is that they never, in most cases, they never bottle the wine. 50% of the wine are drunk in public places. This is the very highest percentage uh, compared to what's drunk here. That means that in restaurants or Bierstube or Weinstube, uh, more than 50% of the wine was drunk, as gehoftete wine, that is wine coming from a barrel, opened wine, opened wine. So only a relatively small percent, and now considering that grocery stores and wine shops also sell uh, opened wine, that is wine out of the barrel for home use, the amount of uh, actual bottled wine in Austria represents only a small fraction of the total production, quite the opposite of Germany. Under similar conditions, Germany succeeds in putting perhaps 90% of their wine into the bottles with labels and so forth. And under the same conditions, Austria maybe produces 25% in the bottle. I don't know the exact figures for it. The, another thing about Austria, it's never developed any local areas that have gotten any reputation, whereas the Rhine is simply dotted with vineyards of, of, uh, of great reputation that have been developed, some of them fairly large vineyards. Uh, worldwide reputations and so forth. If you ask somebody to tell you the name of an Austrian wine with the world reputation, they, nobody knows. 
And um, after having been there three or four times, I would have difficulty in naming more than three or four areas that had uh, really a, a, a reputation of their own. The important thing about Austrian wines is that the, about the main information they give you is the variety of grape. And I've given you four of these varieties here. There are others that we could give you. Uh, Veltliner, that's a real Austrian grape. We have that variety here. Uh, Almaden used to bottle uh, Veltliner. And I believe there's been one or two others that have bottled Veltliner. Uh, Engelnuck has some Veltliner still. Uh, it's a good producer, but doesn't have much flavor or acid, either one. And so we don't think it's of very great importance for California. The Walsh Riesling is the most important Central European variety. It extends from Italy through Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. And Yugoslavia, if I didn't mention Yugoslavia. It's called Italian Riesling quite often in Europe. Walsh Riesling or Italian Riesling. We've tried it here in California. It's got pretty little clusters. It's fairly botrytis resistant. But again, like the Veltin, they're not very much flavor. You could never identify Walsh Riesling if you had it. But it has very regular production, and uh, they, they like it quite, quite well for that reason. The Muller Turgau, I hesitate to say much about the Muller Turgau because we don't really know a great deal about the Muller Turgau. Presumably, uh, it was developed by uh, Professor Muller Turgau, who was a German and then came to live in Austria. It's an early ripening grape with a slight muscat flavor. It's too low in acid in many cases here. That's why we can't grow it here. But it's being planted in Germany, about 10% of the German vineyards now. It's presumably a cross between Sylvaner and White Riesling. But nobody's absolutely positive of that. It's been grow it was developed about 1912, so it's a comparatively recent uh, variety. Rotgipfler, uh, it has a russet uh, character. Uh, Winkler and I made some wines from Rode Gipfler, and you'll find it in that 1944 publication. Not very much flavor and not very much acid, at least here at Davis. Well, the other parts of, I think, of the, of the district are, of Austria are not very important. It's an area that needs technological help. Tendency is to put too many grapes on the vines, use varieties that do not have distinctive flavors. What can you make out of Walsh Riesling that you're going to write home about, even if you had a good winemaker? And also they've begun to borrow that label spate lazy, but they don't make it very sweet over there. They, it's usually on the dry side and sort of alcoholic and dead and flat. So I don't recommend it. I think that Austrian wines are very good in Austria. And they ought to keep them there. <laughs> now Hungary is a different sort of thing. Hungary has been completely socialized and uh, the small wineries are all gone. There are no small wineries. Uh, the, all the middle uh, group of wine shippers and wine blenders or eleveurs, negociant vin, those are all gone too. There are none of those left anymore. So you have these large cooperative wineries or state farms, one of the two, there's a difference. A cooperative actually belongs to the people who uh, are in the cooperative, whereas a state farm belongs to the state and you get a salary from the state. It's the same difference in Russia between the Kovkos and the Sovkos. Uh, but the state farm tends to dominate because they have more money, and usually the state farms have get the choice of the best technical people because they take the people from the experiment stations and so forth. It, it would be possible, if, the, for example, if, if California should be socialized, I'm not in any way advocating that, I might say, but, and, they, and the state of California develop state farms, then they, the Department of Agriculture in Sacramento might say, well, uh, Professor Amarine, you go down and manage the new state farm at um, Fresno or someplace like that. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, you still be a professor at Davis uh, three months of the year, four months of the year. So you see, this is also true in uh, Russia as well as in Hungary, so you see that the people in the, um, in the um, experiment stations have a very hard job um, they have to develop wineries. They mostly run wineries themselves uh, to teach their students how to run, uh, do these things because the state itself puts everybody in a job. You don't go looking for a job in Hungary. They, 
the job comes looking for you. Well, let's talk about just a few names. Their names are now coming on the American market and uh, what their differences are. Right near Budapest, uh, 30, 40 miles from Budapest, is the town of Egri, E-G-R-I. And this is where the oxblood wine comes from. The oxblood wine uh, was originally made from a native Hungarian variety called Kadar. Sometimes it has an S on it. But I believe that the Hungarians prefer that it just be called Kadarka. Uh, they blend this with a variety that they call Medoc, which may or may not be the same as Malbec. It's not Merlot and it's not Cabernet. And I'm not enough of an ampelographer to say whether it is or is not a Malbec. But from the name, you would guess that it came from Bordeaux. There were large importations into Hungary at the time of Phylloxera from Western Europe. The encipagement was changed, the variety picture was changed. These are quite pleasant wines if they just age them a little bit. They got nice, good character. Kadarka is a little flat by itself and doesn't have much color. It comes come out of pink or purple pink color. But with the Medoc, uh, they're able to get a good color tone and a pretty good flavor. I just wish they'd you know, give them another year in the wood and a couple more years in the bottle. Most of those that are coming in now into this country taste like they were made last year, which in fact they probably were. They're, 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 most of the Hungarian wines are white, and all these other districts are white. In fact, you have to sort of look for a red wine. A uh, wine list in Budapest will have uh, ten whites and one red. Uh, Lake Batacasonia and Lake Balaton, Furedi, Soproni is right up next to the Austrian border. There are, and then Tokai, which I'll speak of last. There are 17 named districts in uh, Hungary that have an appellation of origin now. Have an appellation. Austria at the moment is hanging back on appellations of origin. I don't know why. But uh, Hungary is moving very fast and forward on appellations of origin. The varieties for those white table wines, Walsh, Walsh Riesling again, Veltliner again, Kadarka for the red, and Azurcho is another typical and native Hungarian variety. We've tried that one here. It comes out very much like Walsh Riesling and Veltliner, not very distinctive flavor. That's the problem of these, these varieties. Now the middle two varieties, Ferment and Harsley Value, are the varieties that are used for making Tokai, or Tokay in this country, but Tokai there. These are, uh, um, are sweet wines made in eastern Hungary. They're made by a combination of uh, late harvesting, the traditional time of harvest is October the 28th, and botrytis. We've tried everything to make ferment botrytis here in California. Just to, for our own amusement, we thought we'd make, just to see if there was such a thing as token. And uh, they won't, they just rot. Uh, why they don't uh, rot over there, I haven't any idea. I've been to Tokai, I've been in the cellars, I've been in the vineyards, and uh, it's obvious that uh, at least the clone of Tokai that they have has the same shape, the same leaf as the one we have here, but they do get some botrytis, whereas we get just the grape to shrivel up and become brown. At any rate, they pick out the very ripest grapes, which amount to... Uh, in a good year to perhaps 10% of the grapes. These are brought in separately. Now this is the modern method, not the old method, but the modern method of making. The rest of the grapes which are not shriveled or which do not have botrytis are crushed. And then they will take this very uh, ripe grape stuff and literally macerate it. They have little machines to macerate it up. So here you have a grape, uh, you have a big barrel, 10% uh, this very sweet raisin-like uh, mash or mush uh, and over here you have some grape juice. Now if you're going to make a, a dry wine uh, you don't put any of this sweet stuff in it at all. You just let it ferment and you get something around 11% alcohol and, uh, and it's dry. And it's called, I should have written this down because I'm not sure I can spell it back straight up. It's called Zamorodny. That's a dry to a cake, Zamorodny. Now if they want to make it 
somewhat sweet, they will put in some bucketfuls of this real sweet mush material over here. And they make them with two, three, four, and five bucketfuls, although they're trying to simplify it now, and I think just do two and five. And the government has set up some standards. If they put five plutonias in, it has to come out a certain degree of sweetness in the finished product. If they put two in, it has to be another one. It's not important for us as to what the exact sweetness are. These are called tokai. And then right on the label, two plutonias. That means it's slightly sweet. It says it's three plutonias, it's sweeter, four plutonias, sweet, and five plutonias, it's the sweetest. Before the revolution, they used to keep some of this mush and take off the clear juice and make it into what they call essentia. And that's what they gave to the Habsburgs for wedding presents and so forth. They didn't make very much of it. About 8% alcohol and 20% uh, sugar in some cases. The thing I don't understand about Tokay is how it ever got a reputation. It tastes to me exactly like spoiled sherry. And I've tasted literally hundreds of them. As late as this August, I tasted more than 100 Tokays in three days of tasting. And we had nothing but Tokay. They're all oxidized. I think this mixture of botrytis and stuff, where they, they don't separate out the juice, they don't settle, they just take the skins and everything and push it in, the, in this juice that they've got on the other side, this fermenting must. And so they're all brown, they all have high acetaldehyde, and uh, that's, I have no objection to high acetaldehyde wines, but how would you ever get a reputation for those wines? That's more than I can figure out. All right, the A's were starting over here. C's, 